So it's an awesome opportunity to kind of host what I would consider is like an open mic night morning for a creative morning. So where if this was a playlist, we just picked all of you, put you in a room, and we click shuffle play, and the first five songs we're gonna get to listen to are our first five speakers. And so it's my awesome, it's an awesome opportunity to introduce our first speaker. Matt Foley is an author, spoken word poet, and writing coach in Charleston, South Carolina. He's an author of three bit three books. No big deal. Those books are about poetry. It's called We Could Be Oceans, The Typewriter Sutra, and This One Breath. In early 2017, Matt launched Contribute Your Verse, a writing coaching business that helps aspiring writers find their voice and share their creative gifts to the world. So give a warm Creative Mornings welcome to Matt Foley. Good morning. So nice to be here. I've been on a mission for most of my adult life to promote creativity and to support fellow creatives, particularly my fellow writers. And I did that work with young people for five years as a middle and high school English teacher uh, right here in Charleston County Schools. And now I do that work with adults um, as a writing coach and as someone who organizes poetry and literary events all around the city. But I got to tell you, one thing that really broke my heart a lot of the times when I was a teacher was meeting young people that were so creative and curious and artistically talented who really had some real gifts. But when they started telling all the adults in their life, their parents, other teachers, guidance counselors, that they were thinking about wanting to be a writer when they grow up, or a musician, or a dancer, or an artist of some kind, I was heartbroken by the stories they would come to me and tell me that they were met with so much resistance and negativity. They were told, no, you can't make a living as a writer. You can't pay the bills as a musician. Well, I'm on a mission to prove them wrong. I'm on a mission to prove them wrong for all those kids that were told no. For the teenager in me that was told, are you crazy? You can't be a professional poet. <laughs> so uh, that's why I'm so grateful for, for places like this that honor creativity and honor curiosity and give a space on this wonderful morning for a poet like myself to speak. So on that note, I have a poem for you, kind of on that topic. It's called I Know You, an open letter to young artists, though so I, I hope you will find it will be applicable to people of all ages. Okay. I know you. You were the quiet kid, the first in your grade to get braces, and that mouthful of metal went and stole your voice. Writing was a rescue mission to steal back your tongue from silence. Or you were the weird kid, the geek, the nerd. The world looked at you and saw Clark Kent, never Superman, but superheroes lived in the pages of your sketch pad. Bright capes and costumes bursting from the tip of your pen. Or maybe you were the loud kid, the class clown. Born under a bad sign, you were a constellation taking up too much space. You laughed too loud, you told too many jokes, always acting out. You got sent to the principal's office. A lot, didn't you? You see, I know you. You watched the popular ones. The beautiful faces always lit with easy smiles, trying to learn the secret, the magic trick for being normal. You squeezed into their clothes, copied their haircuts, tried to laugh like they laughed. You learned to hold it in, to swallow it whole, to bite back your tongue, to be more like them, to fit in, to not feel so different. But I know you, you are different. You knew that the first time you picked up a pen, a guitar, a paintbrush. You felt it the first time you sang, the first time you danced, the first time you stepped out on stage. For the first time, you were free. For the first time, the world saw the real you. But every time adults asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? You felt a lump grow in the back of your throat. You learned the real answer made adults uneasy. Much safer to say doctor or lawyer because every time you straighten your spine, found the courage to speak 
and declared, I am an artist. You were beset with talk of backup plans and option Bs, fine as a hobby, they would say, but not a career. Be sensible, they said. Be practical, they said. But I know you. You were born for so much more. You were not meant for a lifeless job, a loveless marriage, a slow suicide. I have seen too much starlight in your eyes, too much magic in your fingertips. You were meant to work miracles and to shine with the electricity of your dreams. Believe me, I know you because I am you and you are me. We are artists born to bring beauty into an ugly world and we've got work to do. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Matt. Our next speaker is Leslie Ryan McKellar, originally hailing from the Midwest. Anybody from the Midwest? All right, a few of y'all. Um, she's been an editorial photographer in Charleston for 14 years. She loves pizza, don't we all? She also loves Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Any Buffy fans? All right, two of you. And uh, she loves traveling, taking pictures with her iPhone, and discussing the meaning of life and love with her best friends. This morning, we're all her best friend, and she's going to share a little bit with us. Um, Leslie, go ahead and give her a warm welcome. Put your hands together. Hey everyone, good morning. Um, I'm not gonna show my work actually today, but you can find it um, at lessieryanmckeller.com if you wanna check it out. Um, what I wanna talk about today is something kind of curious that I have discovered honing this craft of photography. And that is that a lot of the lessons that I have learned seem to apply to my life in general. There are these parallels between making a great photograph and sort of making a great life. Um, and so I thought I'd share three quick examples of uh, how that plays out in my life. The first one has to do with perspective. Um, I travel a lot and I have a friend that, that I travel with too. And she's a normal person, she's not a photographer. <laughs> so when she's, you know, when we're out walking around, if she sees something photogenic, she grabs her phone and takes a picture and carries on with her life. Um, photographers do it a little differently, so I'll do the same, I'll start the same. I'll get my phone, because I love shooting with my phone when I'm traveling, and I'll take the picture, but then I'll stare at it, and I'll <laughs> come over here, and I'll take another picture, and then I'll come over here, and I'll squat down, and I'll take a picture, and then I'll get overhead, and I'll take a picture. Um, you guys have seen us do this, right, crazy people? Um, <laughs> So my poor friend, of course, will be like a football field away before she realizes I'm no longer with her and she'll turn around and I'll be like lying on my back on the sidewalk, like getting that straight up shot, you know. Um, and while that, of course, makes me look like a crazy person uh, in public quite often, um, I think it's actually really helped me in my life because essentially I've trained my brain to look for as many angles on a subject as possible, right? So um, photographers kind of instinctively know that depending on where we stand, the subject looks totally different, right? Like the light's hitting it in a different way, um, et cetera, et cetera. So when I'm facing a challenge, when I'm struggling with something, a relationship issue, a career issue, I kind of instinctively know, okay, I need to move myself in the situation, right? Like, I need to understand that the one way that I found this situation isn't the only way to see it. And I, I need to walk around it. I need to really see as many different perspectives on it as I can. Everybody tracking with me so far? OK. Um, the second one has to do with composition. So I've never been one of those people, and I'm actually really jealous of these kinds of people who know exactly what they want at all times, right? Like, you're like, Bobby, you're six. What do you want to be when you grow up? It's like, a fireman. And then he grows up and becomes a fireman. It's like, how the hell did you know that? You know, that's so annoying. Um, <laughs> no offense to little Bobby. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I'm well into my adult years now. And I'm looking at my life, and I'm thinking, 
I did okay. Like, I, I actually kind of love my life. I love my friends. I love my family. I love, love my job. I love where I live. Um, how in the world did I manage to create a life that I love, not having really any idea specifically what I wanted? And the answer to that, of course, is in photography, and it's how I compose photographs. A lot of times, I'll be drawn to something, and I, I won't know exactly what the photograph is yet, but I know that there's a picture there. And so what I'll do is I'll start, I'll just get my camera and I'll start composing by leaving out what I don't want. So, you know, if I'm like taking your picture and I realize there's a trash can right behind you that's gonna be in my frame, I'll just kind of shift, you know, and I'll keep shifting myself, taking out what I don't want. And by the time I end up taking the picture, I look at it and I think, oh, yeah, that's the picture. That's what I wanted. And I did it just by leaving out the things I didn't want. And I've done that in my life a lot as well. I, I maybe didn't know exactly what I wanted, but I'm pretty good about feeling out things that don't feel like me um, and, and sort of having the courage to leave those things out. And I think that's how I've ended up here. So that's a little encouragement for those of you who maybe don't have a specific goal of what you want to do or what you want your life to look like. Um, this is the last one. Is everybody still tracking with me? <laughs> um, super early on in my career, I found myself uh, working on an editorial assignment with a couple other photographers. And as we artists tend to do, I was very much comparing my work to one of the other ones. Um, and he was, to be fair, just better than me technically. Uh, there were, I'm largely self-taught, and so I've always had an eye for photography, but the technical side of things sometimes was an uphill battle for me to learn. And so at the time, I was like talking to a good friend of mine and saying, I suck, like I suck so bad, like he's so much better than me, et cetera, et cetera. And um, she said something that just really meant a lot to me and I still remember today. She's like, you know what? She said, I don't know that guy. I don't know enough about photography to know if he's better than you. I don't really care. She's like, your photos have heart. And when I look at your photos, I see you in them. And that was so important to me because it reminded me of why I do what I do. It's to express me to the world and, and, and make work that matters to me and hopefully matters to everybody else, um, or some people at least. Um, think about it, when's the last time that like, you saw a photograph hanging somewhere and you thought, oh, wow, look at all those megapixels. You know, like, nobody cares how many megapixels are in a photograph, right? Like, we're excited about photographs that move us, right? That touch us, that sort of connect us to the artist or um, connect us to humanity or, or whatever. So it was, it was a great um, reminder for me to continually create from what's really inside of me. And I think there's a lot of pressure in, in the world right now, especially with social media, right, to sort of design this life or to make this life that sort of looks technically perfect and we can put it on our social media page and sort of everything looks like we got our ducks in a row and that, and that kind of thing. Um, but I think really if the life that we're creating isn't a, just a true reflection of what's actually going on inside, then it, it doesn't mean anything, right? And that's not what people need from us. Um, and that's not fulfilling to us. So yeah, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks so much, Leslie. Our next speaker is Nick Jenkins. He's an artist, a drummer, composer, an illustrator, sound designer, and currently resides here in Charleston, South Carolina. While being open to the universe's constant invitations to collaborate via experimental music, Jenkins has been able to enjoy many experiences, both regionally and internationally, through working with great artists, mentors, and heroes alike. This morning, he's gonna collaborate with us, so give him a warm welcome, Nick Jenkins. Good morning. How's it going? Yeah. Sick. Thanks uh, to Redux for hosting this event. Is there audio coming out of this thing? Cool. I'm going to be relying mostly on some pre-recorded audio 
Uh, so thanks for the intro, Kyle. I'm a musician, a producer. I spend a lot of time documenting uh, field recordings and then manipulating sounds for different reasons. Maybe it's theater, maybe it's um, film, maybe it's just backing tracks to play in a band. I play in some bands. Um, for a while, I was performing as Mr. Jenkins. That's my last name. But uh, anytime I would be in a collaborative uh, opportunity or collaborative experience, like having a band, it's a little weird when you're like, uh, thanks for coming to the show. We've been Mr. Jenkins. It's not really accurate. So anyway, after a while, I thought about changing my uh, creative outlet name. So that is uh, Infinity Kiss. And um, it's like one word, five eyes, no Y. But <laughs> to segue into the theme of today, which is curiosity, uh, one of the things I actually thought about for a bit when I was just jotting down some notes was how the words curious and curiosity are spelled differently. Like there's no you in curiosity. You ever think about that? <laughs> it frustrated me for a little while. <laughs> so anyway, uh, curiosity. I am drawn to, uh, I was always in school drawn to algebra and uh, mathematics or things that help you figure out some uh, equation you're using. Uh, Leslie was just talking about uh, removing things that don't work so that you can get to the work you want. And I think algebra uh, helps you f find a solution to something by using what you know, uh, but also uh, you've got variables that you don't know. Uh, so typically in my practice, in my process, I'm drawn to things that uh, are the blank spaces. <clears throat> so once upon a time, I was invited to uh, perform at this experimental theater festival in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, called the Berkshire Fringe, where uh, these uh, performers, actors, playwrights, monologists would uh, perform new works. And um, I had some time to wander around the, this forest, the Berkshire Forest, and uh, did some field recordings. And uh, I found this tree that was uh, a really like hollow tree, and uh, it the just Berkshire looked. Berkshire Fringe, 2012. Crank that. I am standing next to a tree. This tree is a very old tree. It has many broken limbs, but it stands 60 to 80 feet above me and it casts a great shade. It has very musical parts. And this is me performing in the forest with a tree. No one is around, I'm just playing a tree in the middle of the forest. So this particular audio I use often in my live performances where I'm sampling and looping beats from wherever. Um, and then it turns into some other thing.
my main medium is sound. Six years ago, I attended an experimental theatre festival called the Berkshire Fringe in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Most of the journey consisted of taking a train from New York, where I was living at the time. Before the performance, I took a hike around the forest and made field recordings of myself tapping on trees limbs. It was a very special time that taught me a lot about being present. Over the years, I have used recordings like these to sample from and make very glitchy beats and loops and 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 beats and loops. Ha 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 and beats and loops 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 and beats and loops. Ha 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 ha. And this, uh, thank you. So uh, this stuff is called Team Film. It's just a, a material, a really cheap material that a friend uh, gifted to Infinity Kiss. It's, uh, we use it as costume design. We also use it as set design. It's basically a thermal blanket. You can wear it like this. You can also, uh, it's, hard to destroy, so it's uh, durable. It's also translucent, you can see through it. Uh, it's noisy also. Um, anyway, uh, curiosity, collaboration. I'm also drawn to really re materials that you can recycle and um, do things like that with, has no feelings, it's just there. Um, so things that <clears throat> inspire me, how am I doing on, doing on time? Are we good? You got a minute. Cool. Yep. Yeah, things that inspire me, uh, absurdist theater. Uh, if you know anything about Dada art, uh, I'd like to know more, more about that. So chat at me. Um, silent films, those inspire me. There's a lot of room, a lot of space uh, for inspiration. Uh, sci-fi stuff, sci-fi chic, uh, like original series of Star Trek. Uh, they were doing a lot with set design and sound design that not a lot of people were doing at that time. Uh, very inspiring. Also, uh, again, collaboration. There's a lot of room for not knowing because you are uh, mixing disciplines and genres. That's it, I think. Thank you. Growing up, I used to bang on things and just make noises. I didn't know you could do that all your life. And so uh, I won't be surprised if some of you go back to your office and pick up pencils and start just banging on the copier machine and crumbling up paper. And if they ask why, just tell them you're creative mornings this morning. So give a warm uh, thank you to Nick for coming out. Definitely catch up with him afterwards if you want to learn more about that. Our next speaker is Archie Burkell. She is the top hat of the hat ladies of Charleston. No other accessory has such power to express our individuality, and no other accessory is so much fun. Hats will change the way you think about yourself, and it will change the way other people see you. So Matt got the memo. Most of you didn't. I hope that you go grab a hat after this talk. Give a warm welcome to Archie. I don't know how you have spent the past two weeks, but I know my husband and I spent them glued to the Olympics. Since I'm in that mind frame, please cheer me on as I stand at the top of the podium with the goal of stimulating your curiosity and giving you my gold medal advice. After all, everyone's entitled to my opinion. <laughs> You've heard of speed skating and speed dating. My event is called Speed Talking. Let's see how successfully I can nail my hat trick. You be the judge. Here I go. Hold on to your hat. In reality, my competition is against myself. It always is. And it's always the same to be true to who I am. So who am I? You're probably curious about my name, Archie. Not really. It's Barbara, legally one of the most popular names for baby boomers. I simply got tired of being Barbara Who. 
I basically pulled Archie out of a hat when I left my hometown of Chicago. What's in a name? More than I could ever have imagined it could be. Perhaps you've also noticed I'm wearing a hat all the time and are curious as to why. My love of hats goes back 61 years when I was 10 years old and discovered them in a chest in my girlfriend's attic. I can still picture the picture that was taken that day. A hat on my head, a scarf around my neck, and a oh darling pose. Now I could spend the next remaining four minutes of my time talking about myself and my hats. To maintain my momentum, I'll just say, if you're looking for a way to jump start a conversation, pick an odd nickname and try wearing a hat. <laughs> Ultimately, what matters is speaking the language of hats and applying its principles. It may surprise you, but that's what you're already doing. You will wear many hats during your lifetime. Thus, you periodically ask yourself the same questions you wondered about me. Who am I? What am I passionate about? In the process, you may also ask, what do I want to be when I grow up? Well into adulthood. Instead of being curious about your future, let me turn your attention to your past, specifically the first 10 years of your life. Research shows that who we are and what we love is established during that formative time period. There are countless examples from well-known figures like Oprah who couldn't stop talking, Mrs. Fields who couldn't stop baking cookies, and Stephen Jobs who couldn't stop tinkering in his parents' garage, to Olympic athletes um, all smiles in their skis and their, and their skates when they could barely walk. And there's another young child who couldn't stop moving. He was perpetual motion. His parents knew it had to be channeled somewhere. And they brought him to the high school gymnastics coach to see what he could do with him. Well, he brought that young man to the um, Olympics in Montreal when he was 16 years old the youngest male athlete in any sport. This young man would go on to be on the um, uh, Los Angeles gold winning team and earning a medal of his own in parallel bars and becoming one of the most decorated um, American gymnasts. But at nine years old, he knew that was his goal, to be an Olympian. Who was this young man? His name was Bart Connor. He went on to be uh, the husband of Nadia Comaneci. And who was his coach? My husband, John Burkell, who went on to have his own amazing career pulled out of gymnastics. So how about you? What did you want to do as a child? Ask yourself now, what was it that you did by the time you were 10 years old? That's something that captured your imagination that's something your parents didn't have to tell you to do, and maybe even had to ask you sometimes to stop doing it. Therein lies the answer as to what you should be doing. Perhaps not today, but someday in some form. Once you answer what it was, go for it. Go for the gold. Don't dismiss your genuine passion for this thing as stupid. Don't let anyone else label it as stupid. When people started complimenting my hats and sharing their love of them, I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't want to sell, make, or decorate hats. I just wanted to wear them. That seemed pretty stupid and devoid of any practicality. Yet I knew something was there, but what? I was stuck. Once again, my husband came to the rescue. He took his elbow, gently gave me a jab, and said, just take their email addresses, see where it leads, do it at the drop of a hat. A parallel can be made once again with our Olympians. The desire to push the limits of swifter, higher, stronger burned within them. They were lucky to have adults providing affirmation and advice. Once we're older, 
We need to have the strength, or sometimes the desperation, to do it ourselves. The key to turning your passion into reality is to look outside the box. In my case, it was the hat box. I still don't sell, make, or decorate hats. Instead, I created a stylish brigade of volunteers who are making a difference, not only in Charleston, but in New York, where we took our love of hats and made a luncheon for the ambassadors of the United Nations five times. If you want to cheer us all on, come to Broad Street the Saturday of Easter weekend at 11 o'clock and witness our 17th annual Easter promenade. What I thought was stupid turned out to be the most meaningful thing I've ever done, bringing, bringing people together and tying together the threads of things I love doing into one beautiful tapestry. Whether you're an Olympian or a mere mortal like the rest of us, there will be times when you want to hang up your hat. You will be discouraged. You have setbacks. You fall and are injured, physically or emotionally. But you have the power to pick yourself up because you know things change. What doesn't change is what you learned and loved from the beginning. The language of hats is not phrases strung together. It literally gives you something to hang your hat on. Toss your hat in the ring. Take a chance. You're the top contender. The happiest people in the village, um, uh, the Olympic village in Pyeongchang and around the world are those who followed their bliss. To paraphrase Joseph Campbell, if you follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you if you are curious enough to rediscover it. And the life you ought to be living is the life you are living. Doors will open for you that wouldn't have opened for anybody else. I made it to the finish line, and I'm finished. All that's left is to take the winner's stand. I know you have the power to be standing next to me. Hats off to Charleston and your curiosity. All right, thank you, Miss Archie. Our last and final speaker is Lauren Shipley. Lauren has worked in East Africa since 2013 and will be taking her sixth trip there this August. Currently, she's founding her own nonprofit called Artisan Global, which will exist to provide resources, advocacy, and partnership in international artisan organizations in post-conflict areas. Put your hands together for Lauren Shipley. I'm really excited to be here with y'all this morning to talk about a project I'm working on, which is Artisan Global. So Artisan Global is going to be a 501c3 nonprofit that will invest resources into international artisan organizations. This dream began two years ago when I um, was connected with a design company in Gulu, Uganda. The organization was founded to provide employment opportunities as well as a creative outlet for women and men that had been affected by the war. What the founders realized was that providing employment opportunities was just as much of an opportunity to provide healing for reactions such as post-traumatic stress and other symptoms that come from living in a post-war zone. What I found there in listening to their stories was that their identity did not have to be in being a former child soldier or the wife of a rebel commander, but that their identity could be rebuilt in a freedom to create and to sustain their families and to provide their kids an access to education. These women could dream of owning their own businesses and owning their own homes and transforming their communities and leading their families out of poverty. Since Artisan Apparel was founded in 2014, they've created 30 jobs and provided opportunities for women and men to not only cre to create, but to connect with others in a space where they collaborate on designs and also to experience a joy of making something that they're proud um, to see others wearing and to also the process of creating and the process of making something beautiful. 
Artisan Apparel, the shop is set up in Gulu as a retail shop that sells modern African print fashion. And this allows them to expand market opportunities within East Africa and their own country in Uganda. The studio serves as a space not only to create, but also for the artisans to gain social support, which is really important in coping with post-war zones. What I found in working with these organizations was that a very small action could greatly impact the influence that the organization could have on their community. It started with bringing skirts and jewelry back to a boutique that is actually in downtown Charleston, Be The Change Boutique. And what I realized was that partnering them with an organization 7,000 miles away opened doors for them to build new partnerships with more organizations in multiple states and also with other businesses in Uganda. The next step of that was seeing resource gaps. And one of those was access to supplies such as new sewing machines. Just a couple weeks ago, I rallied together some individuals to raise enough money for a new sewing machine. And just a few individuals were able to contribute to completely transforming two new artisans' lives and their families. What I realized that the potential that is there could be growth if people partnered with them and opened the door for new opportunities. Artisan Global is going to be founded as an organization that utilizes many people's skills and strengths to develop new market opportunities as well as business plans and even new tools for them to create. What came out of this curiosity for me was I was curious about how to help. I wanted to know, I love these people so much, but how could I help in a sustainable and dignifying way? And what would it look like for me to step into their shoes and see what the need was for, from their eyes? This took me out of my comfort zone and this nonprofit is a response to that curiosity and realizing that healing is very unique and that providing these artisans with the opportunity to be employed and to also have an outlet for the experiences that they have can allow them to transform their, their own communities and lead their families out of poverty. I'll actually be going in August for a six month stay. This will be building the foundation of the nonprofit and I will be running a marathon in August to raise the first $10,000 to invest in artisan apparel. This investment will be for new tools for them and also to be designing a new training center so that they can begin to employ more women and men in their community. Thank you. So you can stay here and I'm gonna invite our other four speakers back up because I think that some of us might have some questions for our speakers. So if they wanna come back up, Paul's gonna help uh, pass this microphone around so you could be heard as you've got your questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and raise your hand. We're gonna get a microphone to you. And um, you could address the speaker and ask your question. So we're gonna start off with Marcus. Matt, I heard that you have a company where you help people write books and publish books. I think that that's really important. It's really important for those who want to be writers. Can you tell us about your company? Thank you. Um, I didn't tell him to say that. I, I, I really swear. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> no. Um, so Marcus actually gave me an incredible gift uh, a few years ago when I was just an up and coming writer um, where the idea of publishing a book seems so impossible. Like we have these artistic or, or entrepreneurial dreams that just see, seem so impossible. And he asked me just one random day, like, hey man, do you, do you wanna put a book out? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know? <laughs> and he walked me through the whole process and, and made something that seemed impossible possible. And so I, I just been wanting to pay that forward. So I started this company called Contribute Your Verse. It's named after a, a line from a Walt Whitman poem. Um, it's, it's in like Dead Poet Society, you know? Um, um, but basically I, I walk people through the creative process of writing a book. I work with poets, I work with novelists. We, we uh, help you self-publish it. Um, I even help people launch Kickstarters. Like I just had a client, a really awesome local poet named Taekwon. We helped him raise, um, he raised $2,600 to self-publish his book. So he didn't have to pay a dime out of his own pocket to make his book happen. 
So if any, if that speaks to anybody out there, uh, you know, if you if you're a creative writer or want you know a book to be a part of your brand or your 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 mission in this world, please feel free to talk to me. That'd be great. Thank you, Marcus. We have another question back here. Uh, I don't. It's actually it's a trick. I don't actually have a question. I just want to tell you having. Um, Having done speaking and stuff, I you guys have made my week. This is you all individually. If you're wondering what your impact was this morning, and uh, if I don't get a chance to tell you all individually, this has just been uh, absolutely amazing. And I'm looking forward to the video being finished so that I can rewatch them all. So I just really thank you so much you. for taking the risk and giving the thought. Thanks, man. Anyone else from the audience with a question? Raise your hand, and I'll bring you the mic. Okay, right here. Hey, I have a question from Leslie. Um, I am just curious, like, what is your, if you could shoot anything, what's your favorite subject? Uh, I love people. Uh, anytime I have to take a photograph that does not have a person in it, I'm a little bit bored. Um, I don't know how to expand on that necessarily, although something curious about this is when I'm traveling, I'm shooting with my iPhone, I'm generally shooting like scenes, like street scenes, and I really get into that. But when I'm shooting with my real camera, it's I love shooting people. Anybody else? Photographing people. <laughs> <laughs> Re rephrase that. All right, let's, let's wrap up the questions. No, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Right here. All right. Excuse me, I don't know. I don't, I'm paying attention if people have been standing up or not, so let me do this. Um, Nick, I believe your name was. Uh, a musician as well, kind of the, the thing that I've realized when working with others is that there are kind of completely different ways to make music. When you create, do you have a, a finished product in your head that you then try to replicate using the tools at your disposal, or do you start from nothing and piece it together as it kind of works? Um, great question. Justin? Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. Nick? Um, it just depends. Most of the time I work uh, the way you might work with a collage of anything, like a 3D paper collage or, uh, or digital collage. Because um, it usually just starts with some uh, spark of an idea, whether that's just like all me working on something for me or whether it's something I'm uh, sharing with another person or a group of people. I play in a lot of bands, so usually I'm supporting someone or someone's trying to help me uh, articulate something. And so even that's kind of like ping pong, and then eventually you have enough static to justify the, the time you put in. But um, yeah, it's usually a, a process of collage any more questions from our audience back here Hi, Julia <laughs> all right I have a question for Archie uh, I'm very curious if you don't make your own hats where you find them you know the old supply and demand Charleston knows we're here okay. you can find hats at the drop of a hat, and, and, and in some of the most unusual places. Um, I, I still have ties to Chicago. There are more hats in Charleston than anywhere else, and I'm happy to share where they are. I don't, again, I just wear them, um, spread the joy, um, want others who have the passion to come out of the closet and take those hats out of the closet. Um, so truly, there's a lot of places. It, 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 I'm just sort of on pilot light, and I'll see them in some of the strangest places, but I'll help you. I had the pleasure to talk to Archie before her talk, and um, some of you saw me wearing that cowboy hat beforehand, and that cowboy hat's been featured on an Instagram called The Hatterist, and you know, thousands of followers, but what nobody knows, and this is a secret, not anymore. That hat was bought at a truck stop off I-95 for $15. Yeah. And a lot of times it's about the presentation and uh, little t the man behind the hat and the lady behind the hat. Okay. Question here? Can I, can I add one little yeah, bit while you're bringing it? The main point about this whole hat thing 
if you think you can't wear a hat and you really want to, I can help you. Okay? <laughs> I had a question for uh, Lauren. Um, how can the local community here in Charleston support your mission and your work with Artisan Global? Yes, so that's that's going to be the main focus, which was kind of the inspiration behind trying to speak here was really to get the word out. And that's kind of where I'm at now is whatever part that people want to contribute as far as eventually I would like to have empowerment teams that go and work directly with the artisans because I think relation is really important in the giving receiving relationship that it's more about building a strong partnership and being able to collaborate together so that's the dream eventually right now what that looks like for me is fundraising and beginning the foundation of a nonprofit so really I'm open to ideas and whatever ways people want to contribute to really founding the structure of the nonprofit and then advancing with new projects. So any that's the that's really what I want to focus on is identifying people's different gifts and skills and seeing how they can be applied um, because right now the need is great with starting a nonprofit and also um, you know having advocacy and different awareness campaigns and different things like that. So Time for maybe one or two more questions. Do we have anybody else? Well, if not, let's uh, give our panel, uh, our speakers a round of applause. Yeah.